I'd like to welcome all of you to today's lecture. Um, I'm Lane Carpenter. I'm the archivist for um, Lapis Library's history collections. If you haven't done so already, please sign the sign-in sheet right over here to my right um, before you leave. And um, if you are attending, I don't think we have any students today, so I won't say that part. <laughs> um, we have refreshments on the table over to my right, so please help yourself. And we have several current exhibits here at the library. On this floor, we have the exhibit we're celebrating today, which is Life and Limb, The Toll of the American Civil War. It's an exhibit um, that was developed by the National Library of Medicine, and we have several artifacts from the Country Doctor Museum here as well. Um, we also have scientists in their microscopes to my right, and Chris Grimes has his large collection of Civil War era uh, medical instruments here too. On the second floor, we have the Plague of Piracy and the Armstrongs of Rocky Mount, three generations, three doctors, and more. Today, Chris Grimes will present a lecture entitled Jonathan Letterman, Father of Battlefield Medicine. Chris Grimes has, has had a lifelong love history that truly blossomed in 2000 when he helped create a, a local Civil War Navy living history group in Plymouth, North Carolina. In 2009, a friend lured him into the fascinating world of historical medicine and invited him to join His Majesty's Detached Hospital, a medical living history group which portrays a British General Hospital detachment during the American Revolution. This foray into Revolutionary War era me medicine led him to expand his research and ultimately interpretation of Civil War era medicine. On weekends, you might find Chris regaling people with stories of horrific treatments, such as bleeding and purging, at various living history programs or at the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia. Please welcome Chris Grimes. Thank you. Thank you, Lane, for those, those kind words. Um, yeah, regaling people with all these odd, odd treatments and the bleedings and the purgings, and at least by the Civil War, we were beginning to get out of that kind of treatment, even though some of us older physicians would still be enjoying that um, kind of, uh, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of way of curing ailments. But today, I want to focus on Jonathan Letterman and and the idea um, and his place in history as as. I think most historians see is the father of battlefield medicine. I want to start with this, this quote, um, and it's from Major General Paul Holley, of Chief Surgeon of the European Theater in World War II. He says, I often wondered whether, had I been confronted with the primitive system which Letterman fell heir to at the beginning of the Civil War, I could have developed as good an organization as he did. I doubt it. There was not a day during World War II that I did not thank God for Jonathan Letterman. Jonathan Letterman, as I said earlier, is, is viewed by most historians as the father of battlefield medicine. I'll even go a little bit further than that, father of emergency medicine, and we'll see why I talk about that a little later. But it, he was, and, and I see this as a result of not him uh, necessarily coming up with all the pieces and parts of his wonderful Letterman plan. But what he did was he learned how to put a puzzle together. And, and, the, and this puzzle had really eluded most practitioners for a long time. Um, they, were, they were getting close, but they hadn't got there. They hadn't got, came as far as Jonathan Letterman. And his overall plan included... Um, First of all, hygiene and sanitation. Second, we look at battlefield organization and logistics. And third, he looked at the hospital system, both the field and leading to the um, general hospitals. Early life, he was born December 11th, 1824 in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania to Jonathan and Anna Leatherman. Notice uh, Leatherman. That name is used interchangeably by the family, specifically Dr. Letterman, um, the junior, because his father was also a surgeon or a physician. Um, it was used interchangeably until actually the 1850s. 
And after the 1850s, the Leatherman uh, name disappears, and it becomes Letterman. But he did follow his father into the world of medicine. He received his undergraduate degree from Jefferson College in Cannonsburg in 1845, and then he, he went, into, uh, went to Philadelphia to the Jefferson Medical College uh, and attended there and graduated from there. Um, he studied under professors that some of you probably are familiar with. Um, the founder of the college uh, was Dr. George McClellan. And, of course, Leather, Letterman had a, a, a relationship with his son um, later on during the war, during the Civil War, um, as he was his commanding officer, uh, Dr. D uh, General George McClellan. Uh, Robley Dunglinson, the, who's considered by many as the father of American physiology, Robert Houston, uh, Charles Meggs, and Thomas Mutter. Um, and a couple of things uh, with, with, with Dr. Mutter. Dr. Mutter, a great deal of his collection uh, is now the basis of the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I would urge you all to visit there. And as uh, a, a colleague there uh, pointed out too, um, Dr. Dr. Mutter had been working with the whole concept of what we know today now is plastic surgery. So he was kind of one of the forerunners in that. So Letterman actually studied on some really, really well-respected physicians. And after graduating um, there, he, he attended um, the, the Medical Examination Board uh, in New York, and he, was, he passed and was appointed an assistant surgeon on June 29th, 1849. And that very day, he was joined uh, as a newly minted assistant surgeon by a certain William Hammond. And we'll talk a little bit about Dr. Hammond, but Dr. Hammond not only was his colleague, but eventually became his boss uh, and uh, would play a very important part in Letterman's career. Well, what do you do with freshly minted assistant surgeons? You send them out west. You send them out the frontier. And I say out west, we, we have, to have to also include that Florida was a bit of a frontier because that was actually his first stop at Fort Meade in Florida. Now we think of Fort Meade, where's Fort Meade at today? We think, where we think of it at. Yeah, Maryland. But actually Fort Meade, the first, at least the first one I'm aware of, was in Florida. And um, there's not much of there left of that except for a marker. He also spent time in New Mexico, California, and as the other picture points out, um, Fort Ripley uh, in Minnesota uh, spent Went from the hot, from from the hot climate, hot humid climate, up to the, to a little bit of colder climate, but he did. He 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 spent all these places. He sh was treating people, was treating his soldiers for everything from airhead wounds to malaria, and he was usually the only medical officer or medical person for miles around. Now. The Great Conflict, um, uh, the, the, the War of the Late Unpleasantness, the war between the states, or the American Civil War, uh, began on April 12, 1861. Its first shots were fired at Fort Sumter. And of course, the big battle, uh, first big battle, the first Battle of Bull Run, July 21, 1861. The, 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 war, war, the army is woefully unprepared and even greater so, the medical department. It was um, bereft of supplies. It was bereft of uh, some competent practitioners. It uh, honestly, um, it, it was also kind of an albatross because the quartermaster department and the, cor the, the, the actual army commander could say, well, no, you're not going to use this wagon as an ambulance, or you know you're not going to be moving medical supplies with this wagon. We're commandeering it, and dump the proceeds right there on the ground. <laughs> um, and that was part of the problem. And, and of course, it was totally overrun because you're, you're fairly close to Washington, D.C. If you think back to that, that battle, what did you have? You had all of us civilians 
going out to the battlefield, riding out thinking, oh, we're going to spend a nice Sunday afternoon in the park. Well, folks, it didn't turn out quite like that. And Washington, D.C. found itself overrun very quickly with the wounded, um, the ones that could get off the battlefield. Many on this battlefield lingered for days. Many lost their life because there was not adequate care for these wounded men. So you, the medical department's in total disarray. The army's in total disarray. They move down to the peninsula of Virginia. They start fighting, and nothing's any better. Well, Dr. Letterman um, is transferred to the uh, Department of West Virginia as the medical director under General Rosencrantz. He's reunited with William Hammond, who is Rosencrantz's medical purveyor, purchasing agent, for lack of better terms. And while, while Letterman was with these gentlemen, he began to formulate the beginnings of what we will call the Letterman Plan. Rosencrantz had a passion for invention, and one of those key points was actually ambulances. We all have weird hobbies, what can I say? His was ambulances. And with Letterman, they developed the Wheeling Rosencrantz ambulance. And there's a picture of one there. And you will actually see it being used during the war. Now with Hammond, he spent time learning the art of constructing hospitals. Hammond, had, during the 1850s, had taken some time off, went, uh, traveled to Europe, and uh, while there, learned the, the, to learn the European style of making, of building hospitals. And he brought that back. And if you're, I don't know, how many of you here are familiar with pavilion hospitals? Okay, so we have a few folks, good. Well ventilated. They finally figured out, you know what? Air, flowing air is good. Um, and also, somewhat self-contained. And when I say that, the campus is somewhat contained because you have all of your facilities there to cook your food. And, and a lot of times, even your dairies are there and the whole nine yards. You've got everything there as one cohesive system. Letterman studied this and actually uh, oversaw all the, the construction of one, uh, the first one in Parkersburg, West Virginia. And I say the first one, the first Union one, and I'll state it, because there was another fine hospital built in Richmond. Ever heard of a little uh, hospital called Chimborazo? Another, another pavilion hospital of style, a little different style, but very much uh, these are cutting edge hospitals. Well, all the turmoil still going on. He's doing his thing in the Department of West Virginia, and they finally, the U.S. The US Sanitary Commission, along with the surgeon, along with the um, Secretary of War, along with the President, finally, are, they, they, they know they need to make some changes at Surgeon General. So out goes Clement Finley, in comes William Hammond. And actually, the, sur the, the U.S. Sanitary Commission, I'm going to tell you, that was kind of a private offset group of, of civilian physicians and interested people. They became a major power from a lobbying perspective during the war. Um, they had a great deal of influence over medical care and what was being offered to the troops and also provided great, a great deal of support to the medical department. But they were very important in getting Hammond um, appointed. In fact, there was a whole list of people, including Letterman was on the list. But Hammond, Hammond was, a, a, was a, a, not only a good physician, but he was a great scientist. And he did a various studies, and he was well published. Um, and because of this, Hammond, they kind of honed in on Hammond. Well. At the same time, Dr. Charles Tripler, who was um, McClellan, McClellan had actually taken over the Army of the Potomac. Um, he was the medical director there. And, and while Dr. Tripler, I do not want to sell him short, he, he had not figured out a way 
to, to organize the medical department as it needed to be. And so out goes Dr. Tripler and in goes Jonathan Letterman. Well, what greeted Jonathan Letterman? When he took command, he found a medical department in a mess. Scarce supplies, no tinnage, and the ambulances that were there that he had were just totally unfit for service. The Army itself was, was totally exhausted from the early, those early campaigns, and they were malnourished and they were sickly. 29% of that army of 103,000 were unfit for duty, folks. That's the condition. And you cannot fight a conflict with that kind of percentage. It, it, will, not, uh, it will not be favorable for you. Well, upon a landing uh, at Harrison's landing, uh, Letterman started introducing the various initiatives that are going to form his plan. And the first thing he's going to tackle is hygiene and sanitation. And for the most part, the, this, this part is he uses the recommendations of the U.S. Sanitary Commission. Now, I will also say that some of these, these recommendations had already been put into play, but nobody was really paying attention to them. <laughs> um, Letterman made sure they paid attention. He addressed food preparations. He addressed the type of food that soldiers were receiving, the amount of food they were receiving. He, he addressed the, the shelters they, they had, and not only the type of shelter, but their location. And location and how you design a camp is, is, is very important in that you don't want to put it in a low-lying area, do you? You want it on high ground. You want it well-drained. You don't want it to be in a, a cesspool. Uh, you don't want it to be where it attracts mosquitoes, even though they didn't know anything about malaria and mosquitoes being connected. They still thought it was the great miasmas. But, but the, he had the, that's part of the concept. Um, he outlined waste disposal, both human and animal. Um, he discussed, and again, the, the limiting the soldier's exposure to those low-lying areas. And, and not only just the, where they were putting their camp, but you know, where they were going out foraging and, and whatnot. And coming as a native of eastern North Carolina, Union troops spent a quite a deal uh, of their time in swamps. Um, and in fact, the USS Miami during the war was nicknamed the USS Miasma, if that tells you anything. Um, so he, he was on the, on the right track with that. The next thing he attacked was, was, the remo uh, was battlefield organization. He looked at the, the removal of the ambulances from the control of the quartermaster. And as I stated before, the quartermaster could, during a battle, could say, okay, well, you're not, not going to use this as an ambulance. We're going to use this to move munitions. Or he may say, okay, this supply wagon, we're actually going to take and, well, we'll just dump, empty it. We need it for something else. That stopped. He actually pushed the idea and that eventually passed through Congress, the creation of an ambulance corps that had its own command staff, that had its own, the, the own officer that was equal with the other officers so that he could stand up for them and say, you're not going to do this to me. Um, he, and then this is one of the parts that I like. He, he, Luray, Dominic Luray was a brilliant physician for his time. And he was ahead of the curve. And one of, those, that, that, one of those curves was the idea of the flying ambulance system. And this he implemented during the Napoleonic War to, to much success. Letterman took parts of that. Specifically, he incorporated a dedicated stretcher bearer into the ambulance corps. Um, that they would be there to be able to function to retrieve the wounded patients. The next thing he tackled were battlefield logistics. Now this was, he upset some apple carts with this one. Um, he first of all, he again went to the quartermaster's department and said, okay, you have no more control over my medical supplies. I'm going to take care of them. And he put them in the, in, gave it to the brigade surgeons. And he said, okay, you guys are in charge of this. And oh, by the way, this, you know, if, if a medical officer wants something, you're going to send it to him. You're not going to argue with him. 
if they request it, they're going to get it, okay? Um, that's the first thing he, he uh, tackled. Then the second thing he went into was he developed this, a standardized system on stocking ambulances and for hospital wagons. And it was important if you, you look at some of the, 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 the setups of, of these ambulance systems, they were, out, they, were, they were outfitted with certain supplies. A lot of that being foodstuffs. I mean, you, you had coffee on board. You had um, basic, so you can make broth and things of that nature. So you, that was important, just as important as also having uh, bandages and some of those basic items. Um, and then the last thing, he, he um, and they had already been really developed, but he worked with the distribution of panniers or medicine chests, and I have a reproduction one out here on the table, please take a look at that were issued to all, the to all the regimental surgeons, and they were identical. And what you would do, you would utilize what was in the chest, and you would replace it as you needed it. And what that did was, it, some surgeons would try to stockpile supplies prior to this system put into place, and then, well, what happens if they get caught in a battle and their commanding officer says, well, no, dump that wagon. All right, all those supplies that he stockpiled goes away. He's limiting it to a certain amount, but when you needed it to be replaced, there was no argument. It was to be replaced. He also developed a, uh, a, a small field um, che well, a chest, it was more of a, a bag, um, that contained uh, a basic instrument, basic, not instruments, medicines, bandages, and whatnot that orderlies or uh, surgeon stewards that were on the field could actually address the wounded. And then he attacked the hospital organization. And instead of focusing on the regimental level, he said, no, the, the primary hospitals are actually going to be on the division level. Your regimental hospitals are, are going to turn into basically first aid stations. Okay. What I've just described, think about modern battlefield medicine or even emergency medicine. Aren't we seeing the beginning of triage here? And that's a term that wasn't used during the American Civil War, but we, this is where it came from. This is the ideas began to flow together and connect. Um, these regimental stations were, were stationed just behind the front lines. They could assess what the patient needed. They could go in and, and they could bandage somebody that was just, you know, very, received very light wound. He could be bandaged. He could be sent back to the front lines because they had a lot of problems early on with soldiers being wounded and being sent up and, and disappearing <laughs> and not coming back, which I can't say I blame them, um, <laughs> depending on looking at the conditions they were under. But that, this eliminated some of that, the, the people, being, the, the soldiers <laughs> actually going AWOL. Um, and then the more serious cases were transferred to the division level. Now here's, here's one that really shook some, shook some people up. No longer were the senior surgeons going to be the ones that always did the surgery or did the, the most important operations, did your capital operations, if you will. The best surgeons were put in the best spot. And I, when I say that, you were put where you fit. If you were an assistant surgeon and you were a gifted actual operating surgeon, you were put on the, in that division hospital, and that's where you were, over the top of a senior surgeon. You were looked at f for your expertise. You were looked at for your, uh, the, your competency. He put the competent people where he needed them. This really upset a lot of the senior surgeons. And, I, you know, I think we all can understand that. But Jonathan Letterman had one thing in mind. He wanted to save people. He wanted them to receive good care quickly. That was on his mind. 
And then the third thing, and this also fits into especially uh, the medical practitioners here in the room, he, he, he put in the idea of, of cataloging and creating a trail for every one of his patients. Sounds familiar with a lot of the records today that you, you people, that, that you practitioners have to, to, to do. But he, the, there was a, uh, a medical officer in, in every field hospital that ID'd the patient, their injuries, their treatment, and then ultimately their outcome. And this proved invaluable um, for, 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 for us, for, for historians, for, but for later use. You could see the effectiveness of the care that was being given. And here are the results. The changes in the ambulance system resulted in four, approximately 14,000 casualties being removed from the battlefield within 48 hours of the Battle of Antietam. By the, by the Battle of Gettysburg, 20,000 casualties, and that's both Union and Confederate, were evacuated and treated in 72 hours. I put the last state, I put this in bold. No wounded soldiers remained on the field the morning after the battle ended. Looking at the first bull run to Gettysburg, what a change Letterman's plan had made. And I think that's just, that's really the, that's really the hallmark. His, he put together the pieces of this puzzle that we, we call the Letterman plan, and it, and it functioned, and it functioned well. Well, a little more remained to be done. That's a direct quote from Dr. Letterman. He was exhausted, and so he asked to be, um, to be transferred. He was appointed a medical inspector of hospitals for the Department of Susquehanna, and actually he, he actually began to oversee all the hospitals, the general hospitals, hospitals in Pennsylvania as well, um, in January of 1864. And this allowed him to, to still oversee the care of the men that he had actually been caring for previously. Um, he then, well, he, I won't say he ran afoul, but his friend, William Hammond, who promoted him, uh, made him, made him the medical director of the Army of the Potomac. William Hammond ran afoul of some people, mainly the Secretary of War, Stanton, who never liked him. Um, uh, and some people in Congress. Oh, and a few of his surgeons in the field. And they basically had him drummed out of service. And I, there's a, there, I could go into the whole litany of what happened to General ha uh, Dr. Hammond, but um, we, I won't do it at this time. But the fact of the matter is, he was railroaded. He really was railroaded. He was convicted for nothing more, much kind of like malfeasance, but it was it was totally a, it was a kangaroo court. Um, he what he ticked off his the big thing was he ticked off his surgeons because he took murky away from him. Why would he take murky away? Mercury is a wonderful drug, isn't it? We know today that it's actually it's deadly. It's poison. It kills us. But for thousands of years, they used mercury as a wonderful drug to cure everything from STDs to melancholy, being depression. They, they revolted. They actually went to Congress, and they were part of the problem. The other part of the problem was that McClellan and Hammond were friends, um, and also Letterman and McClellan were friends. <laughs> And McClellan had fallen out of fallen way out of favor, and because of this, they wanted to purge the medical department, and they did. Uh, they removed uh, Hammond, and thusly, they were getting ready to send Dr. Letterman back out west to the Department of Missouri. And he said, "Nope," because he had just got married to a very nice young lady, and he said, "I'm I'm gone. I'm retiring." And then he headed out west. 
He was a wildcatter, folks. He was, he was in oil exploration. He, he actually invested in one, some of the fledgling oil companies. Um, they didn't discover any appreciable oil, um, and the, the company actually, they, were going, they went bankrupt. Um, Letterman actually sued his own, uh, own company to try to recoup some of his investment. Um, but that, that kind of was a failed venture. And then he moved over to San Francisco and he established his own medical practice in 1866. And in 1867, he was um, encouraged by the local Democratic Party to run for coroner and um, he did and he won. He, he, he won, kind of, they, it was kind of interesting if you look at San Francisco politics, they kind of went, the parties kind of came and went. It wasn't a you know, Democrat and Republican and all the, it was, you either see all Democrats or all Republicans. So he was part of that, that Democratic slate that was elected in 1867. Um, when you were a coroner in San Francisco at that time, you worked out of your own office. You didn't have, you know, you were giving very little funds. And he lobbied, that's one of the changes that he did while he was coroner. He pushed the city council into giving him an office. Uh, a facility to work with, some employees, and um, giving them a budget. And as a coroner, you did more, you know, coroners today, what you do, you basically, you get a body, you examine it, you do the forensic report, and that's pretty much it. He was more of a detective. He, he was more of a forensic scientist because he would actually go in and actually recreate the situations and try to discover why this person died. So he, um, he served as city coroner. Um, and another wave, another new election, he was, um, uh, if you will, relieved from office. He, he lost his office. And in 1871, he retired from public life. And in, di and in March 15th, 1872, he died from what we think was chronic dysentery. It was some stomach ailment, and most people are pushing it toward the chronic dysentery. He was, at that point, he was, as they said, he was very sickly. And, um, and of course, not knowing what happened, you know, they didn't have what we have today. We don't know exactly what he died of. I think his legacy can be summed up in in one quote, because I think, to, as we've we've found out this afternoon, his plan is much. We still see it today. We see it on the battlefields. We see it, well, out on the streets. And I, and I think this really sums it up. And this quote is from um, George Wunderlich, um, who's the, the director of the U.S. Army Medical Department Museum out in San Antonio. Um, and he was the former director of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. And he was, he was a, a, a volunteer uh, EMS worker, uh, ambulance driver, and he he said the thing, there was one specific horrific accident that he responded to that he watched what was everything that was going on and he said everything we did tonight Letterman rode out on this battlefield 140 years ago and I think that that puts it that brings it home to us I think that's where we all can understand yeah yes he's the father of battlefield medicine but that 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 whole that his whole concepts or, and, and I say concepts, guys, he didn't invent the, reinvent the wheel with this. He just built a better wheel. He built a, a, a better, maybe he, he, he didn't reinvent the rim, but he put a good tire on it. He put it, he brought it all together in a succinct plan that, um, hey, it's, it's survived 150 years, hasn't it? So at that point, um, I'll open up the floor for questions. So we, I have the mic that um, it's connected to the camera. So um, if you could ask your question into the mic, raise your hand. I'll bring it around to you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I suppose uh, Letterman Army Hospital in San Francisco is named for the same individual. And I find it curious that since he was more or less asked to leave the army. He <laughs> wasn't they... really asked to leave it, and I may have. If what he was, he was given the. He was. He basically said, "You're being transferred to Missouri," 
And he said, okay, I've got a new, I've got a young wife. Her family's pretty well to do. They were right there in the, 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 the Maryland, Washington, D.C. area. Uh, I think I'll stay here. Uh, and that's when he resigned. And then eventually they actually moved out west. And what I didn't tell you, part of the story I didn't tell you, they moved out west and he had two daughters. And um, now when they were wildcatting, they lived in some pretty tough conditions. Uh, and, and his wife had moments of sickness. And so he had, they spent some time apart while she was more in areas of civilization. <laughs> uh, so we, she, uh, but when he got out of wildcatting, they settled in and she passed away he had been treating her from something totally related from what she died of. She hemorrhaged. Um, and um, it, it kind of caught him completely off guard. But, of course, they didn't have the tests and the, all the things we have today. So, you, you know, that's, you have to put that into play. Um, he took his two young daughters, and they were actually sent back east uh, to, be, to, to uh, be raised by her family. Because he said, I'm sitting here as a brand-new coroner. In, uh, in San Francisco, and I'm trying to also build a medical practice at the same time, I don't, how can I raise two kids? How can I raise two daughters? So he sent them back to the family. So that's a little bit more of the story. But no, they didn't drum him out. What they actually did is they say, you're going to the Department of Missouri, and he's like, uh-uh, no. And I can't blame him. I can't blame him. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Did the Letterman system also spread to Union armies in the Western theater, do you know? And actually they did. And what actually, before the end of the war, the Letterman system came the standard. In fact, there were several special orders issued that put all these pieces into place. And in fact, some acts of Congress, especially with the Ambulance Corps, that really uh, cemented it. I also want to say that they had already, the, the armies in the West had already started adopting some, had already been doing some of these things prior to Letterman putting together the puzzle. So they were already, I, I don't want to cut, I don't want to, you know, lead you to say they're not, they're, they're, they weren't smart people either, but they hadn't figured out how to put it all together. But they were already doing some of it. Grant's army in particular, there were several things um, dealing with uh, what we call triage today that they were already doing. But Letterman kind of brought it all together. But no, yes, it did spread. It spread to the entire army. And you know what? I'm going on. I'm going to call a segue into a, something I did not bring up. What happened to the Letterman plan after the American Civil War ended? It went away. It actually was, and I say went away. It was forgotten. The medical department, like armies, standing armies at the time, we were everything was shrunk. And when they shrank everything, we were, we lost it. And you saw that really come to play in the Spanish-American War, where we were woefully prepared for the casualties from that war. World War I started America's re-education of their own system. And from there, we didn't forget. We did, we did retain that knowledge, and it carried us into World War II and, of course, our rest of our, our conflicts leading, you know, even today. So, yes? You mentioned at Gettysburg both the Union uh, and uh, the Confederates improved their uh, removal rate of uh, the wounded off the battlefield. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that there has been some transfer of information because both sides would be working simultaneously after the battle end. You were, you were, and, and that's a, a good, a good point. You were seeing the Confederate Army had the medical department, who was, who had able, very able leaders, um, had they on their own were adopting certain pieces of it. But what I referred to, what I was actually referring on that, on that specific piece was the fact the Union Army was actually treating these Confederate wounded. That included the wounded that the Union Army was actually treating. Um, specifically, one hospital that I'm very familiar with this, that was located on the George Spangler farm, um, there were both Union Confederate 
wounded there and being they were being treated and but but yes, but there were, I totally agree, and what I'm seeing is that transfer of information. Not a complete overhaul. You're not seeing a complete mirror image over here on the Confederate side, but um, a very good, a very good uh, uh, parallel. There, there, there's, there are a lot of similarities there. Um, but Letterman still, he, 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 had a, he was just a, a step ahead. Thank you. Um, his plan seemed to require a large number of medical personnel, physicians, surgeons, orderlies. It takes time to train those. The U.S. didn't have a great deal of medical training, few medical schools, and some medical departments. So how did that part of the plan work out? Um, actually, it worked, it, for the most part, it worked out well. When you're looking at the ambulance corps, they did not look for any medical personnel there. They were actually non-medical personnel. Totally, in fact, there, are some, there were some remarks in some of the things I was reading and studying Letterman that, that, that some of the armies would cast off their <clears throat> undesirables to the ambulance corps. But the people that were put in charge, they, were tr they really made sure that they were trained. And they kind of put screws to them. Um, these guys were sharp. They, they were, they, and it, basically it's kind of like, yeah, you take some of the, your slack kids in class, but you, you, um, you show them the right way and you kind of bring the hammer down on them, um, it, it'll make them step up. And that's what, exactly what happened with that. Now, when you're talking about the surgeons and whatnot, yeah, you began to see, they started pulling everybody and anybody. Like for surgeon stewards, they really honed in on people with chemistry degrees or chemistry aptitudes, pharmacy aptitudes, because I'll be honest with you, a surgeon steward during the, the war uh, was really more of a pharmacist than he was uh, an actual steward. Um, that's what the orderlies did. They did the cleanup. And the orderlies, you would take them out of the, out of the army from different personnel and then people that would be enlisting and you would train them. They're, think of them more <clears throat> on like CNAs and things of that nature we have today. Um, but with the, the surgeons, um, the, the one problem they had with the surgeons were, that I see, and again, this is my opinion, was in the general hospitals. They've, most of your really strong surgeons, they, had a, a, they, were, they were experts. They were sent in the field. They were at the division level. Um, and th that's where they were practicing. In your hospitals, you had some really good surgeons, but they needed to be augmented. And they were being augmented by contract surgeons. And that was kind of a hit and miss scenario. And a contract surgeon is basically, if I were a civilian doctor, I would go and I'd agree for so much a month to, to work, but I would not technically be enlisted. I would not have gone through the serious, the detailed uh, um, uh, examination that the, the actual army surgeons had gone through. Um, and that's, if there's any weak point, that the, the contract surgeons, some of them are really good, and those guys actually moved up. But then you had some that were nothing but opportunists, drunkards. Um, oh, I could go into a lot of adjectives with some of them, the ones I've read. It was a, it was a problem. Uh, it was, but, but that, I think that's where Letterman took the approach. I'm not going to put my senior surgeons always in that, that top position. I'm going to pick out the people that could, the, that, that, that had the expertise to actually do the job, regardless of what rank they held or how long they'd been in the army. Does that, does that kind of, it, uh, honestly, I'll be honest with you, what you said is a, tr that was a troublesome problem. Oh, and guess what? The budget was too, when, when uh, Hammond took over, the budget for the medical department was somewhere over, a little over $200,000, and the previous uh, Surgeon General was happy because he didn't spend all the money. It ballooned to well over $10 million while Hammond was in charge. So that's how, how it grew. Yes, Mr. Oakley. Was there a requirement for a medical degree, medical degree back then to practice medicine? 
that's a, it depends on what state you're in. Um, and it also depends, but, but in, uh, in the short answer is yes. Um, we were moving in that direction of actually having our doctors go through medical training and, and actual real medical training uh, and actually go through serious medical examinations to be able to practice medicine. And you were, you were, but you were still in that era that you would attend a medical school um, and then you would do apprentice work under another physician. And that's, that's still, we're still on that track, we, but we haven't got to the full-blown medical schools that we see today. I kind of see that, that, that time that you spent apprenticing was kind of like a residency, um, is, is kind of how I saw it. And it depended on what physician you, you partnered up with is how good your, your skills were. You were talking about the transfer of information and I'd like to know how much transfer of information was there from the Crimea, Crimean War, Ooh. particularly Florence Nightingale's Ooh. systematization and statistics. Oh, she's really digging deep tonight, this afternoon. There's a lot of transfer there. Florence, yeah, and Florence Nightingale was a good part of that. Um, also, you ever heard of the Dragon Lady, Dorothea Dix? Yes. Another, huh? Yes, she, yes, she was. I keep hoping the state will actually take the old hospital and turn it into a medical history museum, but you know, I can hope. You know. <laughs> um, but both of those those ladies, along with you, were seeing physicians. A lot of that information was coming over, but, I, but our, a lot of our physicians were still going over to Europe to train. Europe was still, oh, and wouldn't you love to have been sitting uh, in those operating theaters in, in Edinburgh and in Glasgow and uh, in London, uh, in Paris, um, University of Trek, all those, wouldn't it be cool to have sat there and studied with some of those physicians? So some of that, there was, a, yes, there was a flow of information come from, coming from the European theater. There's definitely, and I say theater, the European continent, um, and, and coming out of the Crimean War. And there's bits and pieces of the Letterman plan that actually came out of the Crimean War. But again, th he's the one that kind of assembled the puzzle. Oh, she's got a question. He um, used lots of the, the ideas of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, mm -hmm. and we know how important they were in the Civil War. Did he actually use the personnel, the men and women of that commission, in some of those field hospitals? You would see them, and, and there was a res Honestly, depending on what, who the, 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 the the actual army officers were, they, there was a lot of, um, <clears throat> they didn't like the sanitary commission people. And so there was some conflict there. So it depended on the situation, but I can tell you this, I can, Gettysburg and Antietam wouldn't have turned out as well as they did if it hadn't been for the U.S. Sanitary Commission. And also two other battles that were in between that, Chancellorsville and Fredericksburg. If it wasn't, especially Fredericksburg, and then again, this is my opinion, if it wasn't for the U.S. Sanitary Commission stockpiling supplies, simple things like blankets, clothing, there would have been many more suffering soldiers. So yes, that's a, that's a very good point to bring up. So this might be kind of silly, um, but that big scene in Gone with the Wind, how realistic is that? Or the whole medical operation while they were there? Okay. How do I want to tackle this? Yes and no. Hollywood has done has painted a picture that's not always accurate. And I will put the blame not only on the ones going back to the 1950s, 
but also your more modern movies as well. Ninety-five percent of operations performed during the American Civil War were performed under anesthesia. And that's where I'm going to, that, that's how I'll tackle that question. Um, you have to understand that our anesthesia we're using, one is chloroform, the other is ether. They were available. Chloroform was preferred because it was less volatile. I didn't have to worry about blowing up my hospital. But ether was also used. Um, in fact, some surgeons even preferred to mix it. It was kind of the preference of the surgeon. But he would actually mix the two, trying to cut down the volatility of the, of the, the ether. <coughs> Dr. Letterman felt so strongly about the use of anesthesia during surgery that he halted capital operations, the, the un the any, any the ones that were not absolutely necessary. He halted them for over 24 hours until the supply chain could catch up. They actually were running out of anesthesia, and he, he said, we're because he understood the, that men that underwent, underwent, off, uh, underwent surgery with anesthesia recovered so much quicker. Now, you think about Gone with the Wind, you think about the crying out, you think about the hollering the men. Some of that is a little, maybe a little bit true. Now, I am not an anesthesiologist. Actually, I'm an insurance agent. Um, but uh, what you're doing, you're using a technique, and I, and I actually had a, a medical practitioner describe it as such. You are putting men, you're putting the men under using uh, conscious sedation. Does that, does that, I, I don't, I, it, it basically you're putting them in twilight. They are kind of aware of what's going on, so you're going to have some crying out, but they're, they're out. They're not feeling, they're not being as traumatized as they were if they're wide awake. Does that make sense? Okay. And that's the kind, because we weren't innovating. We, we weren't putting people completely under. Um, so, but it was, it, but that scene, yeah, I, yeah, it wasn't perfect. Let's put it that way. I, I'll, I'll be, because I do love that movie. But, um, yeah, that was one of the things they get wrong. Oh, there's so many things wrong with medical... Morphine in the 1840s? Yeah, morphine was around. We were using morphine. That's one of the things, especially on the Union side, we had all these, these, these manufactured drugs, these refined drugs, and morphine was being heavily used. In fact, let's not forget that the whole morphine um, epidemic after the war was caused by these returning soldiers that were on morphine. It's called the soldier's disease. And we talk about the opium epidemic today. Folks, we've been fighting an opium, opium epidemic for many, many, many moons, for many years. And I, 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 I say, you know, that's one of the things we did. Interestingly enough, when the, the blockade really took effect on the South, the, the South, um, started figuring out alternatives to all these refined manufactured drugs. And they, they um, in fact, one uh, surgeon, Francis Porche, um, native to Charleston, South Carolina, um, he, was a, he was also a, a botanist. And he wrote a book, saw resources of the southern fields and forest, and there's a copy out here on the table that the, the library has graciously um, let me borrow today. And we have... Um, and it, it gave all these alternatives using botanicals. And honestly, it was like going back in time to the 18th century with someone the, using these botanicals. But there was one drug they could, they even could grow, we were growing opium here in North Carolina. It wasn't as strong, the, the, the strength wasn't the same as what you could get out of the Turkish and the, the Pakistani opium. Um, so you had to bump up your dosage. But we were growing it right here. Um, but there was one drug that they could not replicate. Does anybody have any idea what that was? Yeah, we talked earlier. It was, it was quinine. They never, they couldn't replicate quinine. 
They tried every kind of combination, every kind of bark, you name it, they were doing it and nothing touched it. And malaria was one of the, the, the things that really sapped the strength of both armies. It was endemic. Now I will say this, by the end of the war, one of the interesting things is you started seeing the Union Army predose. They, they were, and then of course the British took that to another level with their gin and tonics. So, um, that was for the Indian War. So, but yeah, that, but going back to your original question, yeah, we had, we did have that. We had actually started, we had actually started um, taking the 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 raw version of quinine and creating quinine sulfate. I mean, we were we were working on this. We were we were actually our pharmaceutical industry was really. It was given a big kickstart during the American Civil War. It was, I, um, in fact, that pannier out there is a copy of what was issued by um, a certain Mr. Squibb. You ever heard of Squibb Pharmaceuticals? That's where he got his start was during the Civil War, making medicines for the Union Army and Navy. Other questions? This is something of a completely different question. I'm curious, uh, you mentioned Letterman that as soon as he graduated medical school, he went into the Army. I'm curious if you have a sense why he made the, chose the Army as his career path as a doctor. I've never, in, in my research, there's no indication why he chose the Army over the Navy or whatever. I, I do know that his father had passed actually before he went into medical school and that he knew that he had to make it on his own. And the Army was one of, those quick, one of those quick paths. If you got an appointment as an assistant surgeon, that actually could set you up in later in life in private practice because you gain all this valuable experience, um, much to the chagrin of, of some of the soldiers. But the, the fact of the matter is, but I think that's why um, he didn't have his, I mean, of course, he could have gone home and he could have or, or, and gone home to, to, to uh, Cannonsburg. He could have started his own, another private practice. His family was very well respected, but the fact of the matter is, I think he, he knew it would be an easier path to go into the Army. Why he chose the Army over the Navy or whatever, I have no earthly idea. Nothing has brought, at least come to my mind and come to my, to, to, into my view that gives me an idea of either one. Thank you. You're very welcome.